pleasure to introduce Dr. Ayan Popel, who is the consultant and chief of uh, pediatric neurosurgery in Sidra Medicine, Doha, Qatar. And he will talk about brain tumor approach to management. Welcome, Dr. Ayan. Thank you very much. And, and a big thank you to Dr. Suleiman uh, for uh, having me here in Dubai. It's the first time I've been to Dubai. And it's very nice for it to have uh, opened up to us um, in Qatar. So um, I'd just like to uh, start by uh, saying, although I don't have any real disclosures to make, I would like to make one confession uh, that I'm um, from England. I'm from Bristol. And uh, I was an addict. Um, I was an addict of football from a very young age. And uh, although I was a member of the, um, the, the local school football team, and I did quite well, I never made it to the English football team, which is a shame, because in 1966, it was the last time they won the World Cup. And um, I could have contributed to them winning again, perhaps. but. Um, I still have high hopes. <laughs> and um, I don't know how many of you are going to be supporting England, probably not very many, but um, I, maybe they'll win, I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, I didn't become a professional footballer. I became a neurosurgeon. And I worked in this hospital, which is a French hospital near, in fact, in Bristol, near Bristol, one of the busiest neurosurgical units in the UK at the time, and I, I spent 20 years working uh, increasingly hard um, in the National Health Service doing um, over 500 cases, personal cases, uh, every year for many years, of which about 200 were pediatric and about 300 adults, so very busy job. I became a clinical director there of neurosciences for six years, and um, also president of the cricket club, which um, you can see on the cricket field just there. So that was, uh, that was better fun than doing the neurosurgery at the time. So I th in 2014, we moved all the services, the, the children's services, down to a central children's hospital uh, in, um, in the middle of Bristol, uh, which had a lot of advantages for the children. They had um, better uh, ITU facilities uh, but unfortunately, no parking for either the parents or the staff. So I spent um, the last few years of my career um, commuting on a, a Honda 125 scooter. And I was very interested in uh, uh, Dr. Orange's um, uh, messages about professional identity, because at the time, uh, our professional identity in the UK was, was being slightly changed, I would say, and this is well described in a, in a great book by another neurosurgeon, Henry Marsh, who some of you may have read, but if you haven't, then it's a great read. It's about being a neurosurgeon for 25 years in, in the UK and how things changed over the years. But uh, that does describe some of the challenges and some of the lessons that were learned during the career. So coming to Qatar was a breath of fresh air and another opportunity for a new lease of life. Um, the flow started happening, as Dr. Orange uh, was talking about, and even though Bristol is quite a nice city, um, Doha is very nice as well, so I'm very happy having uh, come, ac come across in 2018. So in the UK, back in 2010, uh, the approach to brain tumours was not quite so good. Um, the outcomes were not as good Overall, the survival rates uh, were not as good as, as European centers and the best North American centers. And the NHS uh, managers, the NHS England, um, wanted us to improve. And so they asked me to get involved in uh, a uh, review of pediatric neurosurgery services. And you can see on the right um, the, the variability of all the, the operative cases done in different centers, 14 different centers doing pediatric neurosurgery, and some of them doing very few tumor, tumor cases. Um, a great Ormond Street in the, obviously taking the lion's share, but other, other hospitals doing good numbers. And so our, um, 
my remit was to lead the development of standards for pediatric neurosurgery and try to maybe encourage some networking and some centralization of some of the work, particularly in tumors uh, and other complex conditions like epilepsy surgery. So the idea was to have a network approach to be collaborative and improve the outcomes for the children. But unfortunately, as, as um, many of you know, doctors, particularly neurosurgeons, don't like change. <laughs> they really don't. And it was a difficult task to have all these meetings and a lot of resistance to establishing you know, systems that might give rise to better outcomes. But we did come up, we did come up with a lot of standards 90 standards for pediatric neurosurgery in the end we're specifying the minimum safe standards that we should all be aiming for and the key one was to have actually to have someone covering pediatric neurosurgery cases and tumors emergency trauma and everything else covered by pediatric neurosurgeons surprising that in those days uh, adult neurosurgeons were, were doing a lot of the work um, in some of the smaller centers and we tried to create um, pathways for all these conditions, uh, particularly brain tumors, which involved improving access, um, better diagnosis, MDTs, interventions, and rehabilitation, particularly. So access to care was one of the key things. And in the UK at the time, it was six months between the first onset of, of symptoms and um, the diagnosis, which is unbelievable, really, for um, uh, those days, 2010. But now it's improved since we made the changes. And in Qatar, uh, just over the past couple of years, um, we, we looked at this, and it's literally is only 28 days on average between the first onset of symptoms and the first um, neuroimaging to create a diagnosis. So. Early head scanning is the key thing. And if you've got a, um, a country that's got good access to MRI scans, like um, in the Gulf, there obviously is, then you can pick up brain tumors very, very quickly. And um, the symptoms are to anything unusual in a child, just arrange a scan early on. That's my one big message from all this. Um, the services uh, were based around the model of care looking at all these four areas of um, particularly rehab and parent support was one of the big factors in, in the review that we made. At Sidra in Doha, we have for all these um, facilities, all these pathways set up very nicely now, and particularly neuroimaging with good scanners, uh, PET scans, SPEC scans, intraoperative MRI with an IMRIS suite and uh, neuronavigation, which is all important for brain tumor care. The service at Sidra is big and working well with lots of um, uh, members of different teams all collaborating together. And the radiotherapy is delivered at um, Hamad Hospital uh, using some of the better techniques like IMRT and, um, and serotactic radiosurgery. So in Sidra, we, we, we're particularly reliant on uh, the diagnostic uh, services, but also, but also speech and language. I would say endocrinology is very important for some of our patients. Palliative care is very important, and, and the key thing is neuropathology, having a good neuropathologist, uh, which at the moment we've got, and uh, we, we, we meet on a, a weekly basis to discuss the new patients and go through um, our MDT consensus decision the monthly review of neurosurgery patients, um, neurosurgery brain tumor patients, happens um, with uh, selected members of the team. And then they hold a registry of all the patients, the new patients that um, we've had it uh, through the SIDRA system. And we've now registered 112 uh, with a mean age of eight years on presentation. So. Children, um, just roughly the same sex instance, and some of the patients were inherited from Hamad before the service at Sidra started in May. So, going on to tumors. So, tumors um, in children, most of them, well, half of them, fortunately, are low grade, meaning that um, they're low grade gliomas, meaning that they are curable, or they're at least they're controllable. 
And um, the blue on the left is, is what international figures um, distribution of uh, low-grade gliomas, and on the right is Sidra. So Sidra mirrors very much the same distribution with most low-grade gliomas, um, well, half of them, and so the, the purple is the medulloblastomas, and the green is high-grade gliomas, and the rest are a mixture of others, and pineal tumors, around about 8% of all of them. We've seen about six of them, and I'll, I'll show you a few pictures of those later. So principles, what we do, well, we, we have to make a firm diagnosis. We have to make a pathological diagnosis, which is one of the most important functions for, um, as, a, as a surgeon, and then achieving the maximum safe surgical resection, not being too ambitious uh, and leaving a patient with severe disability or risking death, but achieving the, the what we call gross total removal, which is everything that we can possibly see under the microscope. And we try to do it without harming the patients. We have a great team, um, myself and Khalid al Karazi in the middle, um, with supported by four specialists, we call them hospitalists, but they are qualified neurosurgeons. We do um, about, we have done since I started 106 brain tumor or brain or neuro-oncology procedures, including 12 spinal tumors, uh, amongst 583 operations altogether. So that's about a fifth of all the procedures we do involving tumors. And we've got all the, the equipment, the uh, complex um, technology required for brain tumors, and we work very closely as a, a pair of surgeons. Some of these operations take eight to 10 hours, and so we, we have to share the work. We can't, I can't now, in my stage of career, spend 10 hours looking down a microscope without a break. So we, we often do relay surgery, and it works very well. Um, and we both keep um, both of our eyes on the, on the surgery all the time, which adds to the safety. So posterior fossa tumors. In the back of the um, cerebellum, we spend hours and hours trying to get these out. And we have to try and get them out completely if we can. The pilocytic astrocytomas are curable in 90% of cases if you get all the tumor out at the first time. So 10 hours spent fiddling about, we say fiddling about, just doing little gentle surgery to, to remove these uh, is well worthwhile for the patients, cured for the rest of their life. Medulloblastomas, we do the same uh, because their cure rate is going up, even though it's a malignant tumor, we can remove um, all of those in most cases. And then we use different approaches. We either go straight through the vermis, transvermian split, or we go through the cortex of the cerebellum, and we use all sorts of different approaches using image guidance and ultrasound to try and remove these tumors completely. The most difficult tumors we deal with are the pineal tumors because of their site right in the middle of the brain. Um, it's uh, very difficult to approach these without causing damage. And you can see the tumor in the middle there is just next to the vein of Galen and the internal cerebral veins. So we try to avoid having to operate on them as much as we can as surgeons. But so we do do biopsies first. And on the right side, you can see endoscopy, the type of endoscopes we use to go through the ventricle and take a chunk of the, the tumor for biopsy first before we start doing the big operations. Um, and when we have to do the operation, we do it from the back of the head, which is um, an occipital craniotomy. And we have to split some of the, the tentorium to, to get at the tumor safely. And then we uh, identify the veins, retract the vein of Galen, and try to remove the whole tumor. So we've done five of these now successfully. And this is an example of one, a nine-year-old girl who presented with headaches, vomiting, and blurring of the vision. She had a pineal tumor which um, was causing obstruction, so it's causing hydrocephalus, uh, and that was the reason why she was blurring her vision and getting headaches. So we did a third ventriculostomy, that's uh, making a little hole 
in the bottom of the third ventricle to divert the CSF from where it was blocked. And we make it with an electrode under endoscopic, um, endoscopic um, view. And then we can bend the endoscope round to look at the tumor at the back of the third ventricle and take biopsies of it to make a diagnosis. So this is done using a very fine two, two and a half millimeter endoscope. Uh, for, unfortunately for this girl, this, this tumor was malignant. It was a pineoblastoma, which is similar to a medulloblastoma. Um, but uh, we discussed it with the MDT, and they, they encouraged us to do another 10-hour operation, which was um, an open operation to try and remove the whole of this tumor to give the child the best chance of cure. So we started off um, in January this year uh, doing exactly what I showed you on that diagram, which is dividing the tentorium under the microscope, exposing the vein. In the middle, you can see the vein of Galen um, just here with the tumor just peeping out under, underneath. And then we did, retracted the vein of Galen, and just bit by bit, we remove very gently the tumor from the brainstem. And the, the tumor is lying on the back of the midbrain of the brainstem. And you can see it just peeling away gently with the brainstem underneath. That's the midbrain just underneath. So the tumor did come out, and it all came out very nicely. And she did very well. She had no uh, operative um, or neurological complications, and went on to have very quick, uh, prompt treatment with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And so far, she's doing very well with no signs of recurrence. So that's a patient that in the past would have probably not survived um, but if you, get the, if you get the treatment started early with chemotherapy and radiotherapy with no visible tumor, then you can get a good chance of cure with these malignant tumors. So here's another one. A 13-year-old presented very similar headaches, vomiting, drowsiness for a few weeks. Uh, she had a tumor, bigger tumor, and um, this turned out to have uh, markers. So these were marker positive, so this was a germ cell tumor. Um, we had to do an emergency drainage procedure uh, in January in 2020. And then again, the MDT recommended removal. So we set about again doing the same procedure, trans uh, tentorial removal. And she did very well. She, she was, um, apart from some double vision for about three or four weeks, she uh, went on to have urgent chemotherapy, radiotherapy and has not had any recurrence over the past almost three years now, which is from that type of tumor is, is almost a, a cure. When she reaches four or five years, she, been, she can be classed as being cured. So we, we have to try and avoid complications, and the, the, the complications are the things that, that um, reduce the chance of, of um, cure. So the easier tumors for us to deal with are the low-grade tumors, the lesional cases uh, that we see coming through the epilepsy service. We've had an epilepsy surgery service at uh, Sidra since 2019, and we see about three or four of these um, benign, slow-growing tumors every year. Um, and we rely on the epilepsy team to send these patients to us, but here's a case of a 13-year-old who had had seizures since she was six, and she had um, had a, a lesion seen on the scan, on a CT scan when she was six, very, very subtle lesion, which had grown very, very slowly, been watched by the neurologists, um, and had produced a little bit of scalloping. You can see a little bit of scalloping of the bone there with a low density tumor here, um, which was thought to be benign. And so surgery was offered to this, it was a local girl, a Qatari girl with bilateral cochlear implants, these marks here, oops. Um, sorry, I've just flipped it on my, um, let me just see if I can get back. Um, she, yeah, she flipped, uh, she um, uh, presented with increasing seizures. And then in um, 2019, she finally, the parents finally decided enough's enough, let's go for surgery. So we did a craniotomy 
And since she's one of the first epilepsy surgery cases we did, she's been completely free of any seizures since we operated. And uh, her social withdrawal has improved. She's actually getting on very well at school now. Five minutes Oops. left. Yeah, thank you. So I've just mucked up everything now, so I'm sorry about this. Let's just go back to, yeah. So just a, a few more cases, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. This is a, a, another low-grade tumor in a seven-year-old, had uh, um, fits for three years. This was a very rare tumor, a meningioangiomatosis, which was also associated with cortical dysplasia. And we, again, he's been fit-free now for, since uh, surgery three years ago. Sorry, what's, um, sorry, I'm, I'm just gonna have to, I'll use this. And then the final one is a tiny little lesion in the frontal lobe, which um, turned out to be a, a grade one astrocytoma. 15 year old girl, again, a local patient, Qatari girl, whose parents refused to take her from home. They wanted the tumor removed straight away. So we did, and we did it under navigation, uh, um, operative navigation and corticography, and she's been seizure-free since then. So, our epilepsy surgery is, is achieving international uh, quality figures, and they include all these lesionectomies. So, some lesions we, we can't um, advise surgery for. We, we, we advise just observation. And I just want to give an example of cases where we, we feel we shouldn't operate. And, and on the left, you can see a hypothalamic lesion, which is probably a hematoma. It could be a very, very slow-grade tumor. On the right, you can see a tiny little lesion in the middle, uh, which is, could have been a tumor. But this girl had been watched since uh, 2016, and it had actually got smaller. So we carry on watching these types of tumors. Some tumors we can't operate on these. Um, awful uh, diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas, and others we just give radiotherapy for, and we can't, unfortunately we can't do any surgery for, but they still respond to, to therapy, to radiotherapy. So I'll skip through some of the results of what we're achieving with low-grade gliomas, but we should be theoretically achieving cure in these tumors, and in our figures in SIDRA, we, we are achieving 90, over over 95 percent survival and progression-free survival of almost 90 percent. Medulloblastoma should be over 80 percent according to international figures and we're, we're getting there with our setup at SIDRA. So overall the outcome for brain tumors is good in most cases. Obviously it depends on the pathology uh, but you, we, we can achieve good figures uh, if we make the effort. So the take-home messages are uh, early detection, complete surgical resection when you can, but avoid being too bold or maverick in your surgery. Uh, involve your teams all the time, and if you have any cases that you feel um, might warrant some epilepsy involvement, epilepsy surgery involvement, then please send them to, over to us. So brain tumor work um, is tough, it's hard work, uh, but it does rely on great teamwork, and we've, we've got it at Sidra, and I'm very happy to be part of this, this new setup. Um, so, shukran kantia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rapport. We'll uh, keep the questions at the end of the session. So our next speaker,